So, Sean first uh, came to our kind of um, yeah, first came to prominence in, in, in a close shave back in 1995. So, effectively, that it was kind of Nick Park's creation, was he? And then, and then there was the, the TV show started in 2007, and has been this kind of massive phenomenon sold all over the world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, can you just tell us a little bit about the decision to go from something which works very well as a kind of defined, contained seven minutes into a proper kind of feature? Yeah, yeah. from a company perspective, you know, the uh, Sean as a character predates both Mark and I getting involved in this project. It, uh, uh, you know, the original film was made by Nick and then, uh, you know, the character kind of grew uh, in popularity out of that. And... The kind of famous anecdote everybody talks about at the company is that Baby Spice was spotted wearing a Shaun the Sheep backpack, and that gave them the idea that maybe Shaun was quite popular <laughs> and we should make a film. Um, but first, they, they started to talk about a TV series, and they developed the TV series for a number of years, and Nick was involved in that. But then Richard Starzak, Mark's fellow director, um, kind of worked on it and came up with the angle, the angle that, you know, it was a farm... Which was like a factory where the you know the, the farmer was the boss, and the the animals were the kind of everyday workers, and you know and that and that that was the kind of genesis of the original idea. And then he felt for a long time he kept saying to me, "We should make a film of this." You know, I think there's a film in Shaun the Sheep. I said, "I think you're crazy. <laughs> they don't speak." And then Mark came along and said the same thing. You know, we should do this. Um, yeah, you know, so we started working about three and a half years ago, I guess. And did you did you go and look at kind of like silent films and some of the kind of classic kind of comedy? Um, sort of yeah, we did actually. Uh, in fact, we had a thing um, uh, where for a while every every it was great. Every you know every um, it's not like it's all fun all the time at Ardman, but this does sound quite fun. Every lunchtime, <laughs> once a week, we'd have a silent movie and uh, we would sit and watch it and just enjoy it. Um, and um, you know, we were we were definitely uh, you know we were inspired and in awe of and influenced by by silent movies and also by um, the the uh, French director Jacques Tati who made a lot of movies in the fifties which which were silent movies with sound. And I think that's the thing is that Sean isn't really a silent movie. Uh, it's actually yeah. we call it a, a, um, a slapstick comedy without dialogue because there's non-verbal verbal communication, which hopefully, as you've seen, can tell you a lot of things. I mean, one thing that's interesting is in a lot of the Ardman characters, like the eyebrows, make a you know, obviously a, a very much used to kind of bestow emotion and, and so mm -hmm. forth. But Sean doesn't have eyebrows, so that's a bit of a barrier. Um, so does that kind of mean that everybody has to work even harder when it comes to finding sort of the animation kind of? You know? we, we, he's got eyelids <laughs> sometimes. Uh, the animators occasionally they, yeah. they, they can use eyelids. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, you know we talk about this a lot, and I think um, we're very influenced by you know the great Nick Park in terms of. People often say that you know Gromit's this amazing character, which he is, but physically Gromit doesn't do a lot. But the way that Nick sets up his stories and the emotional ideas, you know, when you cut to a shot of Gromit, you already know what he's thinking. It's all there. You're, you reach in for those thoughts. So I think we were trying to do the same thing where sometimes you know you'll cut to Sean and you'll do a little thing, but you know we've done half the journey hopefully and, and half the job with the storytelling and then letting a little bit of subtlety with a puppet finish mm -hmm. it off. And animation is notoriously both expensive and very time-consuming. Um, <coughs> because you kind of had some of the models and the kind of the assets on the TV show, mm. were you able to kind of utilise some of those to kind of cut corners? Or, but I mean, how, how does that work in terms of going from a TV to film as well? Well, it, it was one of the appeals, clearly, that you know we had a lot of the assets made in terms of the look and feel of the world. You know, we knew a lot of the main you know characters, and we were able to kind of take that and expand it out. So it, it definitely helped us, and it helped us get where we are as quickly as we are. Um, but it also presented some enormous challenges for our you know, team back in Bristol, our production design and, and so on, really had to think about how do we build the world you know, in the city that feels like it you know, belongs in the world of Mossy Bottom. Um, and you know, I think they did a, a fantastic job of that. Um, but when you look at it, it's very, very different to, to the world of Wallace and Gromit. Strangely, it's it's a much more modern take on on that kind of world. But how, when you're writing um, the film and making it, how aware are you of the fact that there is an audience outside of the UK? Because obviously, there's about seventy countries, I think, or more than seventy countries who show the TV show. One hundred and seventy. Oh, sorry, one hundred and seventy. Yeah. yeah, over one hundred and seventy. I can't name them all. 
<laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> Start now. Yeah. So, uh, but how aware are you of the, of the, of, of the audience outside? To be, to be honest, we're barely aware of the audience outside the room. Because uh, there, there, there is a thing where, and, I mean, it's, it, where you, when, you, when you're writing, um, even on, on something like Shaun the Sheep, you, you, you're writing for yourself and that you, you want to make yourself laugh and tell stories that you're interested in. And you don't dumb down. That's kind of rule number one now you know, when you're making family movies. Um, so I guess we don't ever consciously think, oh, here's a joke for the grown ups, here's a joke for the kiddies, here's a joke for the French, you know, um, whatever. Here's a joke for people in Alpha Centauri. We kind of like, you just kind of, um, you just re basically get stuck in and, and do what makes you laugh. Yeah. I have to say, you know, from a producer's perspective, it's, it's slightly, I would say something slightly different because I think when you're in the room working on the story, I agree with Mark, you're, you're worried, you know, you have to focus on what you like if you don't trust your own instincts and you know those are the people around you you're not going to make a film but obviously you know one of the reasons we're making a, a film and one of the ways we finance these films is by making the play everywhere so i think that's just the the lovely juxtaposition of working at Ardman is that we have this kind of very definite voice the company you know is known for and that kind of slapstick comedy but we're lucky enough that it travels around the world. And, and, and when you were um, creating the film, was there anything when you were making it that you thought, actually for kids we can't do this and had to be taken out? Or was it pretty much what you would, you know, you'd expect at the end would be there? Or? I mean, I think there's, you know, we're, we're all parents. I think there's things that you, you, you think, uh, that you, you want to put things in that you feel comfortable with as a parent and uh, feels right for the genre and everything. So I don't think we would, we would create those ideas. You know, we would, we would automatically and quite naturally censor ourselves. I mean, there are... A couple of moments in the film, which are like um, bits of, you know, getting mistaken for a surgeon, which are quite dark, but I think we sort of felt we, 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 as long as we handled them in a kind of light-hearted way, we'd be all right. And um, so we, 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 we're careful um, to make sure that it's, um, it's family viewing, but um, I think it's a, just a natural process. Well, I noticed in the credits that you'd put um, a bit about the sort of the charity that deals with people with memory loss or head yeah. injuries. Yeah. I and mean, were there any concerns around depicting that? There were actually, but also by coincidence, I'm actually a volunteer for Hedwig, not to make it sound like I'm some saint or anything. Like, you know, I do so much work for charity, but um, I don't talk about that. But, um, <laughs> but I actually do do some work for charity, and, it's, and uh, in, in, in my other life, I'm, um, I do a bit of volunteer work for Hedway. So I knew about Hedway, and Paul also has an experience of it. Um, if I can speak for Paul, his, his mother's a doctor who's been involved with head injury. So, so we were chatting about it and saying, well, you know, actually, uh, in, in the, the truth is that in the modern world, you know, things that were like in the silent comedy world, you have people banging on the head with hammers and things. Now, people yeah. don't think it's so funny necessarily. So even though we were dealing with that in a light-hearted way, we felt the storyline was sensitive enough, we actually approached Headway and said, you know, you know what, um, would you be interested in, in getting involved? Because um, uh, we think it's uh, something that could, you know, as well as you know, enjoying it and having a laugh, we can also maybe take it and use it to, to, uh, to teach people a little bit about the serious side of that. Hmm. And they were delighted. Um, so we actually had a charity screening um, yesterday, in fact. Um, and um, I just got to mention, can I just say a quick thing, which was um, a Q&A. We had a little time for a tiny Q&A there. I just want to give you a, a sense of the kind of questions we're looking for today. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's my information. Yeah, it? it's for everyone's information. <laughs> uh, there was one um, four-year-old boy who, who watched this film and then said, um, his question was, um, can I ask, have you ever seen a dog eat a banana? <laughs> Um, and, the, and the sad thing was uh, uh, I hadn't, so um, I felt uh, I, I let him down. Paul? <laughs> Paul, have you ever seen a dog eat a banana? Uh, funnily enough, no. <laughs> what a great question, though, Justin. Thank yeah. you very much. Now, you have brought some of the stars of the film along with you, uh, yes. all the way from their home in Bristol, in a very, very precious uh, locked metal box. Uh, yes. So I think it's time now to, to unveil them, if that's OK. Who have you got with us? Wow. So this is Trumper, who's a brand new character. That is Trumper. Mark is demonstrating his animating ability there. Yeah, that's. Uh, I, I'm a complete. I can't actually animate because I'm. Uh, so uh, I'm me getting it to stand up. Neither is a miracle. Can. And then the Sean point. himself. So and this is Timmy. Trumper, yeah. There's Timmy. Uh, Timmy. See, normally, just to explain, you might. I. You probably can't see this, but they actually often get tied to the set, so they're physically held in place when we're shooting them. So. Sean, as a two-legged character, actually doesn't stand up. And Timmy doesn't stand up very well either. No, as you can see, yeah. So they're quite tricky to do, so we'll use a glass. I'm cheating there, look. <laughs> but it really helps you to kind of get an idea 
of the scale that you're looking at when you're making a film like this, yeah. um, because they're so small and intricate, aren't they? They are. I mean, uh, and um, the sets um, that are built for that for that scale, um, it is like a magical kind of doll's house. You know, um, there was um, we built, as you can imagine, you, you know, uh, city sets and um, sets around the farm and everything. And the skill of the set builders and the props people is absolutely amazing. Um, somebody did ask me actually, um, and this was an adult. Uh, asked me when they'd watched the film, um, did you shoot it outside? Because it looks some of the some of the sets look so realistic, yeah. but it's That's all quite done. flattering, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, and and in terms, of, I mean, the other thing that um, making a film allows you to do, I guess, is to actually get to know more about the flock and to give them all kind of individual kind of characteristics and stuff. And can you tell us about the decision to kind of both flesh out the flock, so to speak, and bring in the new characters like Stamper? Um, yeah, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, well, yeah, the flock. Um, interestingly, while, while the series was, was being made and continuing through the series, the, the flock shrinks and grows depending on how many characters were available. So anybody who's a real Sean aficionado will know that. There have been lots and lots of different numbers of flock. But for the film, we actually sat down and physically decided, right, we're going to name all of these characters. So we knew a few already. Everybody knew Timmy and Shirley um, and uh, Timmy's mum were the kind of defined characters. And then we gave each of the others characteristics and little stories. Um, and then we had to develop a number of other kind of characters. So this guy, Trumper, obviously was a new one, and yep. Slip, the dog that's in yep. the film. Um, uh, you know, so we spent a lot of time doing that and really thinking about it. And the, the way they were designed was that Richard Starzak, the other director, would sit and just sketch uh, designs, and then the sculptors would somehow take that and turn them into these amazing 3D interpretations of his work. Because the, the, the drawings you saw on the end titles, end credits, yep. those are, are some of the character designs. I have to say, you know, the, the, my absolute favourite, the pigs as well. You know, if there was ever to be a pig spin-off movie, I would be there <laughs> at the front of the queue. Yeah. Yeah. All right, that's good to know. The, You're not the, the, um, not the only one to say that. The, the, <laughs> the, 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 uh, the thing about the pigs, actually, is they're very difficult to animate. They're actually made of plasticine, um, right. uh, which is unusual. Most of these are now cast in silicon, but um, you know, they, they, they go back to an, uh, an old way. And so they, um, and so they're actually, you know, they don't have a lot of movement in them, um, in the same way these puppets do, because they have. Uh, you know, they obviously have a skeleton inside there which you can move around and stuff like that. I think the first thing is obviously the, the characters pre existed. So, um, uh, and um, Richard Starz, he's also known as Golly. Golly had, um, you know, we had the TV series running. I think the first thing you do is, because you, you talk, um, and it sometimes can be a bit odd to be at an Arvin story meeting, because we're talking, you know, um, sometimes heatedly uh, about sheep and dogs <laughs> and things, but you know, we're talking about their emotional lives and what they would and wouldn't do as characters. So you first of all have to take your characters very seriously, and you discuss them in, a, in, in <coughs> like, you discuss the big ideas. And the, one of the first big ideas we had was, you know, um, well, I think the first thing was when I came on to, to the film was to say that you can see Mossy Bottom Farm as a, a workplace story with a kind of, you know, boss foreman and a workers, but it's also a family story about a father figure and a maybe a bitch as an elder brother and, and siblings. So, so you start by looking at what you've got, and then we say, well, if you're going to do a film, we need to take these characters out of their comfort zone and put them somewhere new and somewhere where we can have fun. So you sort of start to build out, and then you say, well, what about a city? And then you say, well, if it's a city, where would they go? What would happen to them? You know, what were they doing there? So in a way, you ask questions, and you, and you just kind of... Um, and then along the way, you know, you have things like... We, very early on, me and Golly had... Um, we sat in his room in the, you know, in the happy early days, playing the ukulele a bit, and going... And we had cards, and we would just say, you know, think of something like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if there was a barber shop quartet? <laughs> Bang, up it goes. So we'd have a set of cards with just ideas that we, would tickled us. And then we would have this other conversation about what the story might be, and then uh, only two and a half years later, uh, we had a sketch. Yeah, yeah. Because the, the other thing to say is it's true, you know, Nick does sketch constantly. You know, you sit in meetings with Nick and Pete and Golly, and they'll all draw constantly. Um, and you can tell when they're annoyed because they'll start drawing pictures of you, <laughs> uh, generally. There's um, hundreds of pictures of me, I yeah, just realised. An awful lot of that. Um, but, uh, you know, Golly had lots of ideas, and the Panto Horse is probably the, the best example of this, that we spent ages working on the story, 
and golly kept saying but i've got this idea for a panto horse and he kept drawing panto horses and mark and i were saying no no more panto horses <laughs> and of course at the end we came up with this idea we need something to get the sheep out of the city and the panto horse came came about became the thing we needed so you know we found lots of ideas through golly sketches as well and you know, I, and I, so I think it's a bit of both, isn't it, really? Yeah, I it's think a, it is, yeah. It's a kind of, there's no science to it, really. Yeah. Well, uh, tr there's actually uh, about four trumpers, different kinds of trumpers, in different stages of um, distress. As you'll notice at the end of the story, you know, his pants are out and everything, and he's got kind of like his glasses are broken. And, and, in, and in fact, that has to be a separate model. So there's four different trumpers, and I think the process of, uh, from a character design to a puppet, which is then tested, so the animators will then test, do tests to see how it moves and everything, is, is, it's not that long, it's a few months, I think, is that fair to say? It was a couple of months, I think, from the, the kind of signed off sketch. Uh, they do a sculpt, and then they'll move into kind of test puppets and kind of building it like that. And they talk about around two months on model making team, but then you've probably got another month of testing it and making sure everything's working. And then, of course, I think we had eight trumpers. I'm eight, looking at Mark. It's, it's six four, to eight. No, 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 I mean of the actual... Oh, yeah, and you have different... So you have yeah. multiples of the characters. Yeah. Um, so when they make one, they have to work out, you know, how to make multiples of it so they all look the same, which is, you know, it's the process of actually painting them and things is... And you're saying some, some are silicon and some are plasticine still. So oh, these are all silicon. So, so yeah, these, these are all silicon. So trumper is mainly kind of silica and various versions of that but he has got plasticine mouth in here um, and when you look closely you can see the join um, but most of them yeah are not plasticine the plasticine is a nightmare to work with so the pigs and the bull are plasticine yeah. and a few of the other smaller characters